Dr. Sadia Sultana is clinical fellow of cardiovascular imaging at Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Uh, we don't need to talk about uh, the institution where she's at, so that's why we are so excited to have her. And we think in the future, it will be extremely good uh, resourceful addition to our faculty. Uh, she's also former consultant uh, radiologist at uh, Royal Papworth Hospital at Cambridge, UK. The <clears throat> chairperson of the session today, there's two uh, co-chairpersons, uh, Professor Shaheen Islam. We're also extremely proud of uh, Professor Shaheen Islam. He's chief division of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at the Medical College of Georgia. Uh, Shaheen has been extremely diligently active with PHN with several platforms in Bangladesh. And so, so wonderful to have you as, as a chairperson. Uh, Professor Ali Hossein is with us. Uh, everybody knows Professor Ali Hossein. He's a renowned uh, president of Bangladesh Lung Foundation. He's also professor of respiratory medicine, ex-director in IDCH. Ganir Bhandar Jodi Bolte Jai, we are very excited to have you as our chairperson, uh, Professor um, Ali Hossein. As panelists, we have amazing faculty, Dr. Asif Mustafa Mahmoud. Yesterday we had a session, and I was thinking, I wish Dr. Asif Mustafa Mahmoud was there. Uh, he is a great uh, chest disease and TB expert in Bangladesh. He's senior consultant respiratory medicine at Asghar Ali Hospital. And he's also the esteemed secretary general of Bangladesh Lung Foundation. Now, the most exciting person with us is, as a panelist is Professor Rumi Ham um, Khan. Um, exciting Bolbo because Rumi just got promoted as a professor. Rumi Amadir Oni Jr. Shajun, I'm so proud of your achievements. He's professor, professor Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care, Dell Medical School, University of Texas, Austin. Thank you, Rumi, for joining. We will be extremely excited to hear your comments. Professor Abdul Hanif Tablu, we know him as Tablu. He's professor and vice principal of Dhaka Medical College. He's professor of neonatal and pediatric surgery. He will be joining us momentarily. Um, two very one amazing panelists from Bangladesh, Dr. Farzana Alam. I'm so proud of you. I'm very, very bullish. Or take to the nor, or take to the nari. Why? Tahole purusha kano at the cost to coach. Thank you so much for joining, Farzana. Um, assistant professor, radiology and imaging at BSMMU, Dhaka, Bangladesh. We'll be um, looking forward to hear your comments. Dr. Dini Mujahid uh, Farooq Osmani, he's a cardiologist. Wonderful to have you. We know CT is making amazing strides to diagnostic cardiology and may even take over some of the intervention. He's ex-fellow ex cardiac MRI University Hospital, Zurich in uh, Switzerland, and he's a cardiologist at BSMMU. Thank you so much, Dr. Farooq Osmani, for joining. So without much further ado, I'm actually um, the moderator of the session. I'm Dr. Aisha Sigder, Professor of Medicine and Pulmonology at University Pike, Kentucky. And I will open the session um, I'm, I'm, uh, I have some family commitments. I mean, I will turn over to Professor Shaheen Islam to moderate the rest of the session. And I will ask Dr. Sadia Sultana to speak. So she's going to talk about CT of the thorax. Can you have CT thorax? chest physician important if you could dissect the human body without uh, sacrificing a drop of blood, without just 
without a knife or even a drop of blood. That's what the CT thorax is. Sagittal section, coronal section, uh, axial section, that's what Sadia is going to explain. I mean, the exciting question participants, Big T, Dr. Lulu Habibur Rahman, Amar Kup Kathir Bundhu. He's really, Lulu is a, is a scholar in pulmonary medicine in the United States. Thanks for joining. I mean, Dr. Adnan Choudhury, I mean, Kauke, mention Nakote Pari, please speak up at the end of the session. We are very excited. Onike join Koreche, Sadia, it's already 70 participants. So now the boat is yours. Thank you so much, Sadia. And again, I'm so proud of you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Mm -hmm. Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much, Appa, for a very kind introduction. I'm really humbled. Um, I'm a Bangladesh bully. I'm a um, opportunity to pelam. Thank you, PHA, for giving me the opportunity to be part of this platform. Um, uh, CT thorax uh, is a vast topic. Um, and I'm a clinician, but there will be some radiology trainee probably through um, Farzan Alam Abu, um, maybe some medical students. So what pitch should I go at and what should I include and what or should I not include? So Ami, a physician opinion, what do they want to know? Um, and some of them said it's all about lungs. That's what they think about CT thorax. So probably from my cardiovascular background, I put some other information as well. Anyway, you will see. So a karo karo kache ta khubi easy mone hote pare, karo karo kache mone hote pare, okay, something very rare I'm showing. Um, I'm really sorry, I apologize if it is not uh, um, very interesting to some of you, but I'll start from very basic. So I'm going to share my screen first. I'm going to stop my video to um, save some bandwidth. So I'm sharing my screen. I just have to reload it. I'm really sorry. Just do something funny. Just give me one moment, sorry. I'm trying to share. Toma, you're in the background, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Tomar Kothaik to Bolte Hoy, the amazing uh, shop organized Kore. Okay, Ashul Amra at the Birok Tokuri. Thank you so much, Toma. It's great. The screen is on. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we see yes. your screen. And can he, he, you hear my voice cut? Um, okay, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, as you said, our talk is about CT thorax. Um, it's mainly directed towards clinician, but as I said, there will be some medical students and trainees um, and some, some of them are from radiology. So I'm going to talk about um, the scanner itself, very basic things, um, what we look at. Uh, some points to address before you uh, scan a patient. This is particularly for clinicians, um, radiation protection, protocol selection. This is predominantly for radiologists, but why it is relevant to the clinician. Um, image post-processing, some uh, trick of the trade, basically. Common terminology used in radiology and some quiz cases. Um, so I'll have 12 cases as, as quiz. Uh, if you have a pen and paper handy, that would be really great. And uh, some of you I know joined from uh, phone, but if you have any laptop or iPad or something handy, 
If you join from a little bit bigger screen, I think the projection is going to be slightly better to appreciate the changes I'm going to explain. And then in the end, we'll discuss about the quiz cases. So this is a CT scanner um, for the um, medical students and trainees. This is the extra tube, and these are the detectors. And it rotates 360 degree around the patient, and the uh, patient stays in the uh, bore of the tube, and that's how images are acquired. So every pixel gets some information. It's all about shades of grays. And then it formulates into an image by different computing mechanism. So very briefly about other cities uh, you have heard of, that's PET city and SPET city. So we're going to talk about all about CT, uh, just simple CT, computer tomography, um, from where we get the information about the anatomy and pathology, but we don't know the metabolic activity. So the PET city is used mainly to see whether an abnormality is metabolically active or not. So the radiopharmaceuticals are injected according to what body part we want to image, and according to the activity, it is scanned. So PET uses positron. Uh, this is positron em emission tomography, and SPECT is single photon emission. Usually, it's, it's a gamma camera that detects it. It's more simpler than PET CT. So, this is a PET CT image, which is in grayscale, I'm showing. But um, that's how we, we look at it. But for you, probably, you'll get a colored image to see. And this is a SPECT image of a heart, which is um, using only gamma camera. And uh, for cardiologists, there is an infralateral infarct uh, clearly seen by you, probably. So um, this is a PET CT. That's how probably it comes to you with lots of um, color coding. And you can see the metabolic activity. So we assess some normal area, some abnormal area. Um, and uh, we do hybrid imaging. So we do some CT scan with it so that we can co-register and, and do some attenuation correction when we interpret the scan. Uh, this is an MRI scan, a scanner. Um, for the trainees who has never seen one, it looks exactly, almost exactly the same as a CT scanner. Um, this is a huge magnet, actually. It, it, um, it uses a different property of the tissue. It looks at the hydrogen um, molecule of the tissue. So this, this is the scanner, which is basically the magnet is uh, more than 30,000 times um, stronger than the gravity. So imagine how strong the magnet is. That's why the room looks so empty. Um, we are not going to talk about um, MRI today. That's another topic for another day, just to show you how the scanner looks like. So what we are going to do um, today is mainly um, talking about CT. So what, is, what are the indications for CT? Why do we do a CT thorax? Um, so after clinical assessment and some blood results, if you need additional information, then you do CT thorax to see inside. Sometimes it's very useful to clarify a chest X-ray abnormality. Suppose something in the mediastinum you think may be abnormal, but you cannot locate it or you don't know what kind of abnormality it is. So imaging of tumor, it's very important, maybe benign or malignant. Um, you sometimes do it for acute um, um, symptoms or maybe some chronic things. Uh, CT thorax is generally done for lung um, as most of the clinician believe, but other parts of cardiac imaging, vascular imaging, lung cancer screening is a big thing in Western world at this moment. And um, a lot of CT thorax done to screen high risk patients for lung cancer for early detection. And CT guided interventions are part of, of CT thorax as well. So this is very important for the clinician. Um, why I mentioned, because this is, um, I worked in England and America, and um, all the clinicians, uh, particularly junior doctors, when they start their rotation, they are always briefed about it in their induction training. So what is the clinical question? It's very important to be very clear about the clinical question. And in your mind, as a clinician, you need to think how this imaging can help answer this question. Is it this? specific CT scan we need, or do we need a PET scan or MRI, you know, to think about the modality, or it can be done through just simple chest x-ray. Which body part to include? So if you tell me I need a CT thorax, but you are actually looking for a metastatic cancer, then the patient has to come back um, for, again for another a body part scan. So sometimes think about whether you want to image chest, abdomen, pelvis or not, you put it together. How can you communicate the clinical question with the radiologist? That's a huge thing. We struggle every day, even in America, 
Uh, I struggled in England. We struggle in everywhere, basically, this communication problem. So the clinician would say acute shortness of breath or say, OK, no coronary artery disease and request a scan like um, as, as a checkbox. But we have to dig out the history and see what exactly you want from us. So um, whatever the clinical information you have, we may not have all of it, particularly in Bangladesh, because it's not an um, online system that you look into the notes um, uh, straight away, you may need to find out from the clinician. Most of the time, what we do as a radiologist, we don't have time. So we just guess you know, what you want, and then we protocol it. I'm going to come to protocol because that's extremely important to get a good scan, to give you the correct information you want. So I'm going to emphasize again and again and again on this. It's the communication between the clinical team and radiologist is the most important thing in radiology and to manage a patient clinically. Um, Radiation effects you need to think about in specific scenarios, like if a pregnant patient comes with chest pain, whether you want to do um, CT uh, pulmonary angiogram to rule out uh, pulmonary embolism, or a VQ scan can be done, or any alternate methods out there. Radiation effects are more important for children because um, they've got longer life expectancy, so cumulative dose of radiation may induce cancer in them in future. For Patients over 70, radiation dose is not a big matter anymore because the scanners are so fast. There are um, the fifth generation scanners are there now for the new trainees. Um, generation one, two, three, four, it mainly depends on how the image is acquired, what is the what are the number of detectors, how uh, what's the length of the scan, uh, and also the radiation dose. Image post-processing is a different thing. So just for an example, the radiation dose is really low now in a way that if it is clinically indicated, we often um, scan pregnant patients and children are scanned using dose modulation methods. So there are particular parameters we change in the scanner to make the dose as low as possible. Um, so um, just to mention, we can scan a heart, a beating heart, um, in 50 millisecond. So 1,000 millisecond equal to one second. So imagine uh, what is the time span of a scan is 50 millisecond. So um, the other consideration you have to have is renal impairment and contrast allergy. So we use iodinated contrast for CT scan. And uh, some patients can be allergic to it. And some patients may know that they are allergic to it. So you need to clinically assess what is the level of allergy and what medication you can give. So maybe one or two scans a week I do. Um, patients are on pre-medication, some steroid and some antihistamine to get the um, scan done. So it's still safe, but you just need to um, be extra cautious with patients with contrast allergy. Renal impairment is a big thing um, everywhere. But actually, all the recent papers, meta-analysis, are showing that there is nothing called contrast-induced nephropathy. So you, you may relax, basically, about it. So contrast doesn't cause renal impairment. It's basically the other comorbidities patients have already um, renal impairment or septic patients. They may have higher chance of having some renal um, deterioration after contrast. So um, we use EGFR here, but you can use creatinine if your institute doesn't give EGFR. But usually EGFR is calculated from serum creatinine levels. So it's quite easy to get. You can call the lab and say that what's the EGFR. Um, so we use the um, uh, number 30. So if it is less than 30, we inform the clinician that you need to prehydrate. It's not a contraindication as such. You may need to prehydrate or post-hydrate, maybe with oral or IV fluid, depending on what. And patients, particularly on dialysis, when you scan, it's very important to coordinate the timing of the scan with dialysis time. So immediately after, or not immediately, on the same day of scan, um, if the patient had dialysis after the scan, then contrast will go out of the system. So these are the special things um, a clinician need to think about before um, doing a scan for a patient. So the protocol I was talking about. So for us radiologists, we protocol the scan um, according to your question. So it can be non-contrast. So suppose you want to see interstitial lung disease or TB or something, then we can do without a contrast, very quick scan. But if you have question about any of the blood vessels, I'll show you the scans. 
it's impossible to comment on the blood vessels if I don't give contrast. So don't request any scan. Um, <laughs> you want angiogram off without contrast, okay? So if you think there's something wrong with the aorta or coronaries or pulmonary artery or pulmonary vein, we can do all together. So if your question is, I don't know, just tell me whether there's anything wrong with the aorta, whether this patient has got pulmonary embolism, or there isn't anything wrong with the pulmonary veins or left atrial appendage, or there's a clot in the heart. We can uh, protocol it. We can do one scan because we can um, administer contrast, timing, and everything. We can titrate it. So we can answer your question if you're in doubt. But it's better to have one question, of course. For cancer staging, we need contrast for sure because lymph nodes will be better appreciated, I will show you. Um, plural pathology, uh, if you say just simple plural effusion, that's fine. If you ask for empyema, we need to give contrast because we need to tell you, maybe infected or not, but anyway, um, it is clinical diagnosis as well. ECG gated and non-gated, I will come about it. Um, uh, so basically, uh, well, how we acquire the scan for the gene? Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is it you're in the presenter mode? Is it anywhere possible to go to full screen mode so they can see the pictures better? Uh, I'm in the presenter mode. Yeah, because I can see your next slide. Can you see, an, see so my you, next slide? No, 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 because it's showing up as a smaller um, window on the right side, the next slide. Yes, so if you go to your slideshow. Okay. I think she needs to go to the slideshow, yeah. Slide yeah. show. If you go to a slideshow and then pick. Uh, I think what's happening there when she's sharing the screen, I think the wrong screen is being shared. She's in pressure. Oh, okay. okay, I'll stop sharing, then I'll go to screen share again. Yeah, yeah, just, just if you get if you the right window. Give me two seconds. Sure. So. I did it once. Uh, unless you have two, uh, do you have two screens? I have on your two computer? screens. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's why it's doing it. So you have to pick the window that you want to share. Yeah, yeah. She has to do it. Or, or, or go into the mirror mode. Okay. I don't know what it is, why it is doing that. Okay, it is sharing. The, okay, anyway, I can go to. Okay, it's giving me the other screen. That's a problem. Uh, it was doing okay. Stop share. If I take the other screen out, probably it will be better. Give me one second. Okay. Sorry about the interruption. No, no, sorry. I didn't know that it's happening. Thank you so much for telling me. I don't want to show you my notes, my secrets. So. So if you just do a mirror, uh, mirrors. No, 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 I can't share. Mm -hmm. I can share the bigger screen now. I just disconnected the other screen. So share screen. Okay. There we go. You got a slide. Is it better now? Yeah, much now better. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, so, sorry, I went to. Okay. So how we acquire the image, we take a scanogram or topogram for juniors. So basically uh, for the radiology juniors particularly, always look at the scanogram because this is uh, wider than what you do uh, the CT scan because this is a collimated one. So we don't want to radiate the abdomen. So uh, when we first position the patient in the scanner, we do the scanogram or topogram, and then you can, uh, we cut it down up to there. So if patient comes with chest pain, you don't find, I had a case only two weeks ago who came for coronary CT angiogram, um, didn't have anything uh, in the lungs or heart, had a big gold stone, which of course was not visualized on the CT thorax. So always look at the scanogram. That's how we scan anyway. Uh, 
And contrast enhanced or not enhanced. So for junior trainees, what we do, according to your question, again, the clinician ask about, okay, show me pulmonary arteries, show me pulmonary embolism, we select that. So the way we do it, we ask the machine to trigger when, uh, if we want to see aorta, this is uh, for aorta. So we put the ROI there. If we want to see pulmonary artery, we want to say ROI, put ROI there. Sometimes it is done in a different method that's called um, uh, test bolus. So uh, the technologies determine the time according to um, cardiac activity, basically, uh, cardiac function. But most of the scans are done, uh, which is set up by um, bolus tracking. So the machine um, decides when to start scanning. So the technician doesn't have to uh, show it. So the phases of contrast, I'm probably reiter reiterating the thing again and again, that's um, how, what is the timing of contrast? Depending on that, I can give you answer. So it's different phases. This is, uh, you can see both aorta and pulmonary artery. This is aorta and pulmonary artery is not opacified. So if the Hansfield unit of pulmonary artery is less than 250, I'm not going to be very specific about whether there's a small P in lower or segmental pulmonary arteries, but if it is, properly opacified, it's very sensitive and specific picking up smaller varieties. Sorry. So um, ECG gating, I was um, talking about, this is a patient from last week, basically. The reason I wanted to show to the cardiologist, um, they, uh, the clinician deal with acute illness, like in ED situation or intensive care, um, you need to know, and a lot of clinician, even in Western country, don't know this ECG gating. Um, I work in a very um, developed city, I would say. But most of the scanners don't have ECG gating. Scanners have, sorry, but the technologists don't know. The radiographers don't know how to use ECG gating. So patients with acute chest pain, they do aorta imaging without using gating, and we get this image. And uh, I think... Two, three days ago, a cardiac surgeon uh, rang me at nine o'clock at night. I was on call. Say, okay, can you tell me whether there's acute dissection or not? So this is, so for the junior trainees, this, this is a line that looks like a flap. And that's how dissection looks like. Aortic dissection is a life-threatening emergency situation. But the difference is, I just told her, this is not gated because there's a lot of motion. Heart is always moving, right? So this is not gated. Just get a gated scan. And then I can tell you, this is the gated scan. Look how clean it is. Um, and there is no flap. So I, I have seen patients in a tertiary center being operated on this scan. And they opened the chest. They did thoracotomy in a young 37-year-old looking at this scan. And aorta was absolutely fine. So think about like, what about me going to hospital having this kind of management? You don't like it. So always you can never comment on aorta, particularly aortic root or ascending aorta without doing ECG gating in terms of whether there's acute dissection or not. That's the main thing or acute aortic syndrome. So ECG gating is used. We put the leads on the chest and then we ask the machine to trigger at, this is systolic imaging, so 200 to 440 millisecond of cardiac cycle, and it gives, gives us this motion-free image. Not all technologists know it, so not all centers can do it, but if it is available, that's the best thing to do for these type of patients. So concept of Hansville unit, I'll be using a lot of Huntsville unit in you know in my in my talk. So it's basically differentiating density. So this is a number unitless number. This is crucial for determining the density difference in terms of problem solving. So um, radiology is basically a pattern recognition. So you see something normal and you compare with abnormal and you know this is abnormal. But sometimes um, density of the tissue may look the same. And what we do, we put our cursor and it gives us, us a CT number and express as this. And water is always zero to may, may go up to 10, but higher than that, you may think it's blood. I'll show you some cases, then you will know. Bone is quite dense. Contrast depends on the concentration, usually similar to bone, if the contrast opacification is good. Lung is always minus, fat is minus, and air is always minus. So th this is how we do the density difference. Suppose this this was, um, I didn't know whether this is a bit of fluid or is a solid organ or is a um, hematoma. Then I put my ROI. It's available in every pack system. If you see uh, the images with a DICOM viewer, you can see I know most of the clinicians in Bangladesh don't get um, CD images or um, look at the images on packs. So for them, I have got other methods. 
Um, so that's how we do it. This is with contrast, this is without contrast. Without contrast, this is containing blood, that's why it's 50. And with contrast, the mean has changed. But we look at the mean, we don't look at this. Windowing is another thing. So when I asked one of the clinicians a couple of weeks ago in Bangladesh, um, what do you look at when you look at a CT thorax? And he just straight away said, I look at the lungs. You can see lungs only. So actually, then I, initially I thought this presentation is going to be all about lungs, but then I changed my mind. I thought that, okay, people should know a little bit more with what we can see in a CT thorax, basically. So window. So what you get is a lung window. You can see lung. If I give you on the film, um, you are a clinician, I'm a radiologist, lots of films of this image, and you want to interpret lung, that is impossible. This is this is a soft tissue window or medicinal window. You can see medicinal structure, soft tissue on this window, and you need to get lung window to assess lung. Similarly, you cannot assess bones like little fractures or little metastatic lesion you cannot see without windowing. So windowing is to increase contrast in, in the soft tissues, basically, according to whatever preference you have. Most of the PAC system has got a set window. So you can um, say, I want long window. I want to just click on it. But you can change it manually using your cursor, uh, mouse as well. So this is bone window. Look how it is set up. This is window width and length. I'm not going to go into the physics of it. So anatomy in different planes. So that is extremely important. You can see sometimes, uh, I will have some examples as well, a mass looking like um, maybe um, two centimeter. But if you go to coronal plane, it may be a flat atelectatic band. So don't assess the size of it, only looking at the axial plane. So images are accurate. So uh, for the junior trainees, um, we slice the body into millions of pieces. So uh, it is volumetric acquisition. So now the scanner, the smart scanners, most of the scanners from third generation to second generation onwards, um, they do volumetric image. So there's no gap in data. And you can um, get any type of reconstruction you want. doesn't matter um, what thickness you want, what type you want. I will show you some of those. So you need to look at axial. This is coronal and this is sagittal. So from side to side. And this is from front to back. And this is axial images. So we are going to talk about anatomy now. So I chose, of course, a lung window because everyone is more interested in lung. But this is a post-contrast image I um, chose because I want to show you how contrast comes. So I'll go to the beginning again. So from left subclavian, it's a left arm injection from left subclavian vein. It goes into the, so going down, brachiocephalic vein, SVC, now going down. It's going to the right side of the heart first. And then right ventricle and then go up. So pulmonary artery has gone already. So when you look at a scan, you think whether you want to go craniocaudally or caudally. So basically top to bottom or bottom to top, according to how it is displayed on the film. Sorry, I don't have film, but um, for a clinician who, who um, gets a film, you need to look one structure at a time when you go through it. So I have I tried to make, make some, make some uh, a film. I will show you in a minute. So um, this is lung window. So you look at the, this is the right side of the body, by the way. This is left side of the body. Imagine you're looking uh, uh, at a patient from the leg side. So this is the right side of the patient. This is the left side. That's the orientation. So you can see the airway, how it is going in. This is a scrollable image, which is difficult to follow. But um, I will go to the airway. So if you follow the airway you, on the film, you follow the airway only. Don't look at any other structure. You'll get distracted and you'll miss something. So this is the carina going into the right main bronchus, bronchus intermedius, and going into the right middle lobe, right lower lobe. On the left, it is already lingula. And this is left lower lobe divided by the fissure. I've got other images as well. So I'll go to the next slide. So I am... Um, I try to give you other planes as well. These are soft tissue window. I'll be talking about the window again and again and again because the quiz cases I have, it's all about a window because um, you need to look at specific structure in specific window. So this is soft tissue window in a sagittal. So it's going left to right. So you can see how things are looking on this plane. Okay, I'm not going to explain. Um, this is coronal. So that's how the... 
So these are all axial images reformatted in these things. Okay. So looking at the lungs, <clears throat> so I'm talking about the fissure. So you, oh, everyone knows anatomy, I, I know, but it's very difficult to see the fissures. So uh, fissures are plural uh, reflections, basically. So um, this is the oblique fissure from the top. So it's coming when you scroll, you can see how nicely it comes like from top to bottom. So I have uh, I have three different images of the fissures. So this is horizontal fissure. So the, on the right side, upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe. So between horizontal and oblique fissure, abutting the mediastinum is the middle lobe. On the left side, usually there are two lobes, but some patients with heterotaxy syndrome may have three lobes. Um, sometimes people have azygous lobe, that's an accessory lobe, which is a normal anatomical variant. So on the left side, this is the oblique fissure coming down. So it's um, uh, imaging is in a different plane, as I said. It looks a bit different, but this is lower lobe. And, and this is the uh, fissure on the sagittal plane. So this is the upper lobe and this is the lower lobe. Medicinal anatomy is very important to understand because different pathologies happen in different compartment. Um, so this is anterior medicinum, this is middle medicinum, this is posterior medicinum. But international um, thymic uh, malignancy group now decided to change it. Now means 2017 because there's a big discrepancy between how we radiologists talk about medicinum and cardiac surgeons talk about medicinum. So they put it as um, this is anterior, uh, not anterior, this is prevascular pre mediastinum. And middle mediastinum is now visceral mediastinum because all of the viscera uh, lie there. And posterior mediastinum is now paravertebral mediastinum. So if you come across those terminology from radiologists or cardiac surgeons, that has come from the ITMIG group uh, from 2017. So a little bit about the aorta. This is volume rendered image. So for the trainees, um, the bulbous portion is the aortic root, root and then ascending aorta, arch starts there, uh, where the brachiocephalic artery is. Uh, sorry, this is, I will, uh, if I put it this way, it will be easier to understand. Okay, so this is the brachiocephalic, left common carotid and left subclavian arch is down there, then descending aorta. So I tried to make some films for the clinician, but I failed um, really badly because I didn't know how it is displayed. I have never worked with CT films before. So here um, you need to look at left and right side separately, unfortunately. So this on the left side, you go clockwise and the right side, you go clockwise. So on the top, I just put some slices. Um, otherwise, the uh, talk is going to be lengthy. This is non-contrast images. So you can see the three vessels, um, the arch branches, then the arch coming down, coming down, sorry, there, ascending and descending aorta, aortic root, and then coming down, heart starts coming down coming down, coming down, then you can see part of the upper abdomen as well. Because always um, plural, plural recesses go down to the abdomen. So this is the lung window, similar things I wanted to show. So upper lobe, upper lobe, and then going down, you can see how where the uh, trachea bifurcates. So there, this is the right middle lobe bronchus. This is the lower lobe. So this is middle lobe, lower lobe. And then now it's going, oh, sorry, there, going down. This is further down, lower lobe, lower lobe, middle lobe, and this is lingula. This is post-contrast images, similar. I just wanted to show how, how you want, want to go down, but the display is not optimal. So as I said, contrast looks a bit different. So what we do is, um, as a radiologist, this is the trick of the trade. Basically, we put the images in multi -plane, multiple planes, so axial, sagittal, and coronal, to appreciate any abnormality. Usually, actually, is enough to diagnose a problem, but for problem solving, you sometimes need other planes. And if you want to let clinician know what you're talking about, sometimes it's very good to give other planes and save it on packs or on the film. We do oblique reformatting as well, carved re planar reformat we do to straighten a vessel. So that's mainly for a vessel. And thickness, uh, we changed. Um, intensity projection images for radiology trainees, we use maximum, minimum, average intensity projection. But the main thing is min maximum intensity projection for lung nodule detection. I will show you why. And we do volume rendered images, the one I showed on aorta, because 
if you uh, some of you remember this famous picture of Prince William, Prince of England, um, when he had a baby, he showed this. Um, so some photographers took it very uh, offensively, and then basically he was showing three. So if you see one object from one plane, it may look or interpretation may be very different. So you need multiplanar images. So that's the multiplanar images. So that's MIP. MIP is basically um, that accentuates areas of high densities. So if the nodule is not seen on the normal lung window, a radiologist, or if you use PACS, you can use MIP to get a, um, a little lung nodule. So this is carved uh, planar format to see the vessels. And these are volume render images, pretty pictures we can make as well. We never diagnose any disease from these as a radiologist, but it's always good to give to the a clinician, um, particularly uh, surgical planning making. So special terminologies we use, speculated. So that's, those are the speculs. That is very sinister. We try to um, communicate with you. I don't like it. Stranding. This is clear fat. This is dirty fat. Stranding, we say sometimes there's stranding around. And, um, that means either it's inflamed or invaded or something wrong going on with it. High fluid, high attenuation, low attenuation, we use for high density and low density structure, kind of synonymous. We use indeterminate a lot because we want to say, I don't know. Invade and abut. So this is a butting nodule, and the other one is invading. So invading means it's, it's not good. Sometimes we say likely means I think 90% I'm sure, but radiology is never sure. So likely means it is. Convincing, consistent, you know that we are very sure, and suspicious is suspicious. You investigate more. That's the communication from our side. So very quickly, 12 questions in six minutes, the very um, rushed uh, quiz, but uh, if you have a pen and paper, it's for self-assessment, nothing for me. If I uh, was uh, present in front of the audience physically, then I, I would be able to ask questions probably. So um, I will start now. The first case is 44-year-old male with shortness of breath. So um, for the trainees, um, some cases are very easy, some cases are not what you can see. So when I put first housekeeping thing is when I put soft tissue window, that means I want to uh, think about, uh, want you to think about the soft tissues, okay? So anything abnormal in the soft tissues, don't look at the lungs. Next case is a 64 year old man who presented with shortness of breath after a long haul flight. I think he flew from Sydney to America. Um, and uh, he was tachycardic uh, and uh, his blood pressure was low. His saturation was 88% on five liter of oxygen. So I want to, this is a post contrast image. So you need to look at the vessels, whether you can see anything abnormal or not. 58 year old female with progressive shortness of breath. This is lung window. So you need to look at the lungs. This is axial and this is coronal. The same patient in 2011, this is the CT, and this is in 2022. This is a 58, case four, 58-year-old smoker, had a lung cancer screening CT. So you just look at the lung window because um, they put on a lung window. I'm going very fast because we need to discuss these cases. So I have got a zoomed in view of the um, lung as well for you to appreciate the problem. This is a 48-year-old female with chronic cough. This is a 70-year-old gentleman who was biking and he fell and came with chest pain. So first look at the chest x-ray whether you can see any abnormality and then look at the CT and lung window. Thirty-seven-year-old male with non-specific chest symptoms. So I put two chest, um, two chest X-rays, three years apart. This is three years ago, and this is, uh, I think, one year ago. But um, the interval between the two chest X-rays, so three years. One is normal. This is normal. This is abnormal. So think what is abnormal very quickly. Then I will show his CT as well. This is the CT. 
So this is axial and this is coronal. I want you to look at the soft tissues in the blood vessels, not the lung. And he had a PET CT as well. So this patient had a motor vehicle accident. It will go very quickly. So look at the lung window. I don't think you can look at everything in this one, but I will play twice. So if you have finished following lung, you can now follow the tube probably. It's very fast, I know. Okay. 57-year-old female had a chest CT. Sorry, it says chest twice. For an acute reason, had an incidental findings. So incidental findings is this small nodule. Uh, I tried to zoom in, but the resolution is not as good. Two years later, he, she presented with this. This is the pet city. This is the lung window. Next is 67-year-old. This is my patient from last week, came in with shortness of breath. So this is post-contrast images in soft tissue window. So you know what to look at, sorry. And this is a 39-year-old with known connective tissue disorder. If you think anything is abnormal, you can write it down for yourself. I'll concentrate on the medicinum. And it was, if you think it wasn't picked up, then two years later, this patient came in with this. The same patient. This is an image of different patient, but this happens to similar patient. That's why I put it there. So this is axial, this is sagittal image, if you can see the abnormality. This is a case from last week as well for, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, all of the cases are within the last week or so. So this patient had a biprosthetic heart valve. You can see this metal density there, um, presented with fever after some dental work. Is there anything abnormal you can see there? This is very important for the radiology trainee, if there is any, extremely important to identify this. I've got the last case, which is 46 year old only, has got some atypical chest pain, has been investigated previously in the USA with three nuclear perfusion study, which were negative. And now primary care physician just got fed up with him and then sent for a CT coronary angiogram. So this is not coronary angiogram. This is a non-contrast um, images of the chest, you can say. So if you can see anything abnormal, there's no contrast here. Okay, so we're going to answer and discussion. I, I cannot say or see how you did, but it's for your self-assessment to spot the diagnosis. So we'll go to the first case. So this is very simple. This is a pleural effusion I was going to show you. So pleural effusion, uh, small pleural effusion. So this is the pleural space for the trainees. On the right, there is none. On the left, there is some basal atelectasis as well. If I put in lung window, you'll be able to see the basal atelectasis. So this is pleural effusion. So if you ask me as a radiologist, tell me whether it's blood or is it simple fluid. From the look of it, I can say that it, it is most likely, probably 70% likely it is fluid simple fluid, but it may be blood. I don't know. So what I do, I put my cursor to do the ROI and I get Huntsville unit of 12. So I'm 100% sure it's a plain fluid. It is not blood. That's how we are so sure about hemothorax or hemopericardia because we know what will be the Huntsville unit. So next patient, probably most of you could identify something is wrong with the pulmonary artery. What is wrong is all this low attenuation area, the lots of thrombus in the blood vessel. So had a PE after the uh, long haul ride. So it's a big volume pulmonary embolism, basically. So I have got a um, scrollable image. It's displaying a bit flat, but you can see what is the volume of thrombus. And right heart is slightly bigger than the left heart with the septal uh, flattening. So when we do um, pulmonary emboli imaging, we sometimes try to, as a radiologist, try to give the indication how, although clinically you know, the clinician, how bad the volume of thrombus is. This MPA, this main pulmonary artery is bigger than the aorta. That means 
there is a large volume thrombus causing pulmonary pressure to go up, and that is causing back pressure to the right heart. So right heart is enlarged as well. With um, the interventricular septum is flat. Sorry, the projection is not perfect. So this patient also had so pulmonary there, can you, can you, some hemorrhage as well. Sorry. Sade, so could you go back to that one and just show them that how a saddle embolus would look like the last the CTP? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then the right and left pulmonary artery. So I think that it'll be very helpful for the participants to know. I'm rushing a bit because of the time. Don't worry about the time. I think it was a very good lecture. Is it okay lecture. to go a little, a little slowly? Okay. Yeah, probably. I, I didn't think. want to rush. Um, so this is saddle embolus. Okay, so it is straddling over the bifurcation. It is going both into the right side and left side. So the mechanism of it for the clinician, um, you all know, it's um, uh, usually uh, after long haul flight is DVT. So if you Doppler the lower limb, you will be able to find a um, uh, filling defect in one of the veins of uh, deep veins of the lower limbs. And that travels through the IVC, come to the right heart, and then it goes into the pulmonary artery. And that is a life-threatening condition. This much volume of clot can kill a patient very shortly. You have seen he's a young man, but his saturation is only 88% on five liter of oxygen. So he is compromising. The other thing is the assessment for the radiologist, um, assessment of the right Right ventricular uh, compromise in terms of um, right heart pressure increase or PA enlargement is important because some patients are candidates for thrombolysis. So I don't know whether it is done in Bangladesh or not. That's why I didn't go there. But um, these patients are very good candidate for thrombolysis, sometimes thrombectomy. They do mechanical thrombectomy of the pulmonary artery as well here. So it's very important to say, and they come to us, they come to us and say, can you tell me, uh, is there any right, right heart strain or not? And this image is not that great, unfortunately, but basically the right heart chamber will dilate and the interventricular septum will be flat with pressure. Um, and there will be some regurgitation in the IVC. Contrast should thumbs I showed you from top of the um, body. So from brachiocephalic to SVC, it shouldn't go into the IVC, particularly hepatic IVC. You will see lots of that's sign of tricuspid regurgitation, basically. Those are all combined signs of um, right heart strain. And these patients are candidates for thrombolysis. This is, this is a small <coughs> feeling defect. So that's how small PE looks like. And this is acute PE. If it's if it's chronic for radiology training and for a pulmonologist, it it layers around the um, artery rather than being in the center. This is like a what it is called polomid sign for acute thrombus. So this patient also had on lung window. If you go, um, there is pulmonary hemorrhage and infarct. So that is the consequence of the pulmonary embolism. Our third case was this case with progressive shortness of breath. As I showed you the um, image in 2011 and 2022. So I don't know whether some of you appreciated this abnormality. So this, if I say this is normal lung, this is abnormal lung. I'm sure uh, most of you identified. But some of you probably thought this is emphysema because I used to think as a clinician when I used to see that uh, it may be emphysema. But if you see this has got a wall, I will show you the cases of emphysema where there is no wall. I, I've got, uh, I think next case is that, just to differentiate. The, the, there is interstitial thickening, and this is very peripheral and subplural. If you see the distribution is lower zone predominant. So there is architectural distortion as well. So this is lower zone predominant, subplural, peripheral, reticulation with honeycomb wings. So these little cysts, uh, which are stacked one after another, are called honeycomb wing. So these represents pulmonary fibrosis. This is an interstitial process. I'll show you the emphysema case, but this is interstitial process. This is managed completely differently than um, emphysema or other causes I'll show you. Um, uh, when you see these cases, you need to think about if the distribution is at the top, the differentials are different, 
if the um, distribution of the fibrosis is predominantly at the bottom uh, or uh, mid to lower zone predominant, the differentials are different. So upper zone predominant causes are mainly, we you, you see probably in clinical practice, TB, sarcoid, um, radiation, but lower zone is predominantly um, EYP pattern, um, which is maybe NSAIP or EYP. Um, IPF, uh, when it's idiopathic, there's no cause. Connective tissue disease, asbestosis or aspiration can cause it as well. Drug-related fibrosis is usually, usually upper zone. So this is the progression of the disease. So if you see preliminarily, it was mainly interstitial thickening. There was no, not much traction bronchiectasis. Probably there's a little bit of traction bronchiectasis. There's a big difference between traction bronchiectasis and primary bronchiectasis. So this is not primary airway pathology. This is primarily interstitial pathology, which is putting traction of the bronchi and dilating it, basically. So these are all traction bronchiectasis. I will show you the emphysema case. Then, no, this is primary parenchymal pathology. I showed you the case, case four. So there are holes in the lung, and that doesn't have any wall. So there are big holes in the lung. So these are um, emphysematous area. So with this one, I gave you some paraseptal emphysema, which is pleural based mainly. You can see it near the fissure or periphery of the lung. So the difference between emphysema and uh, uh, interstitial lung disease is the pathological um, uh, start of the disease is completely different. Um, this is a patient uh, I didn't show you on the quiz, but additional case. Um, uh, if I ha had audience, I, I could ask, what do you think about these holes? So all holes, right? So these are not emphysema. This is, these are lung cysts. These are air cysts. Because if I differentiate this, there is no wall to it. It's just like a, a permanent destruction of the lung parenchyma. But there, these have got little walls. So this is completely different pathology. The, this patient has got lymphangiomyomatosis, so lab. Um, LCH can cause it as well. Neuro, neuro, so differentials are completely different when you see cyst with um, wall. If, if there's one or two, uh, that may be previous infection or some trauma, something causes little nematocells. But there is numerous of varying sizes. You need to think about the other pathologies, other underlying condition. So these are not emphysema or interstitial process. So I, I had a close um, shot of that to show you the wall. So just to differentiate, this is emphysema and this is interstitial lung disease. So there are holes without any wall. These are very irregular. It may be very mild like this or moderate like this or the severe one I have shown you. And this is interstitial lung disease. And bronchi, this is his primary bronchial pathology. So look at the bronchi, uh, bronchi. The lung brain chyma is okay. It's mainly centrally distributed. And the uh, case I showed, those are all peripherally distributed. So the pathological process, if I start talking about it, it, it needs a different lecture, the interstitial lung disease part, to be honest, which I plan to do in future. But for this patient, this is a cystic fibrosis patient, actually, who um, uh, the junior doctors who know this, the CFTR gene mutation that causes thick secretion. I'm not going into the pathophysiology. Um, and uh, they eventually get bronchiectasis. So see how the airways are dilated and this thickening of the airway um, and some mucus plaguing as well. So this is upper zone predominant and, um, and this is cystic fibrosis patient. Post-infectious um, bronchiectasis you see for COPD patients, usually lower lobe predominant, sometimes only middle lobe and lingula, um, but for cystic fibrosis, usually upper lobe predominant. And this patient also didn't have something, that is the pancreas. So there's a lot of fat there. So this is normal pancreas looks like. Uh, this, uh, uh, the patient had vanished pancreas. So they get the cystic fibrosis patient, get uh, atrophy of the pancreas and looks like there's nothing there. But actually the pancreas is replaced by fatty tissue. So pancreas is absent. This is a normal patient. And this is a very simple case. Everyone got it, I guess. So from no chest x you can see there's a pneumothorax. So um, if, if you can see, I don't know um, what you're using, but uh, probably the projection may not be optimal, but you can see the lucency with the lung marking. It's difficult to appreciate in the upper zone, but in the lower zone, you can clearly see there's no lung marking passing through. So for the junior doctors, how we differentiate um, anything from um, pneumothorax is you have to see a lung margin. 
and there's no interstitial marking going through that uh, clear space. So if I ask you to compare the right side to the left side, if you see the lung markings coming through, there's no pneumothorax, and there is basal pneumothorax. And on CT of the same patient, you can see the apical and basal pneumothorax. So this patient had pneumothorax, and this is the post-chest drain. This is the pleural drain placed in, and this um, compressed lung, uh, collapsed lung, became inflated again. Most of the cases, you don't need a CT for a pneumothorax, though. So this is a very interesting case. He's 37, and this is normal. And he came in with nonspecific chest symptoms. So whether you can appreciate there's something, there's a bit of fullness there, right? So that's a mediastinal I'm mass sorry. or some kind of mass overlying the hilum, right? You can see the hilum. So um, he had a CT and I showed, so that mass is looking like, so this is, if you uh, correlate with the chest x-ray, probably you can see this mass is causing the um, fullness and the silhouette is lost there. Um, this is the actual image. So there is a large medicinal mass um, with a, a small plural effusion. So uh, this mass was active peripherally. This is, uh, as I said, PET CT is to see metabolic activity. So on CT, I can tell you there is a mass, but I don't know what kind of activity it has. Is it completely cold or is it hot on PET or what it is doing? So we give radiopharmaceuticals and there is some activity there. So the PET staging was done for this patient. The only active part was the thymic mass. Um, so he was operated on. So he was cured from his problem. So the debulking was done. Um, uh, uh, they said it's, uh, all margins are clear. But unfortunately, he presented a year later with this. So this is a plural invasion from drop metastasis from the thymic malignancy. So as you can see, there are uh, metastasis in the pleura. So if you see right side of the pleura is clear on the left side, there are dense structures. Mm -hmm. So this is again, soft tissue window. This is not lung window. So um, you can see the fat plane is lost. So invading in the pleura, there are some lung nodules as well. So he had a radical pneumonectomy on the left side and still on chemo radiotherapy as of Friday. I checked his notes. So um, I didn't have many differentials uh, in terms of pictures to put. So I, I took these pictures from radiographics article. Um, so anterior medicinal masses uh, can look like that. Uh, if you could scroll, you could see it's coming from thyroid. It looks very sinister, but it is not. Um, you can see teratoma, which is a big fat-containing mass in the anterior medicinum. The way you can see fat uh, visually from the subcutaneous tissue and uh, um, uh, the fat inside the mass is the same density. And you can put your ROI to see what it will be minus for sure. There's another one. There's a time exist. So if you put ROI, it's going to be either 1 to 10. There's a posterior medicinal mass. Um, uh, this is a neural tumor coming from the neural uh, foramen. It's a very, very um, regular outline, a, a bit heterogeneous. This is a patient with myelofibrosis who has got these lumpy, bumpy masses. These are all extramedullary hematopoiesis. So that's how it looks like on the coronal plane is paravertebral masses going into the... So it's paravertebral medistinum rather than posterior medistinum now, according to the new nomenclature. So this was our um, trauma case. So um, almost 100% of um, motor vehicle accident or uh, road traffic accident comes to ED. Um, they are uh, they all get um, uh, CT of the whole body usually, including head. <laughs> so this patient, what you can see first, this is lung window. So in lung window, you can see air very well. So for all the uh, trainees, I would recommend to use lung window to exclude pneumothorax, to exclude uh, pneumopeitoneum, anything pneumo you want to exclude. It has to be on lung window. You cannot exclude it in soft tissue window. That's impossible because it all looks the same. So what this patient had, so this is the tertiary care center where I work and uh, they saw the big pneumothorax. Um, I think the paramedics put this chest train in. 
And unfortunately, this is in the long time chyma. If you put it in another plane, you can see sometimes the chest tube can uh, follow the fissure, and that's still the pleural space, but this was definitely in the long parent chyma, and you can see the blood inside or the debris inside is completely blocked, so it's not going to work. So as a chest physician or a radiologist, it's very important to appreciate that because this strain is not going to do anything, um, uh, any benefit rather than harm. So that's the chest strain and had uh, surgical emphysema and had some pneumothorax as well. So I've got some still picture because it's difficult to follow the scrollable ones. So this is the chest strain. This is surgical emphysema. So if you palpate the patient, it's crunchy. Um, there's the pneumothorax apically, pneumothorax basally. And if you put on lung window, uh, sorry, bone window. So without bone window, you can you cannot appreciate um, bone fracture. So it had multiple rib fractures. So that's why you need to do the windowing. So this is an acute situation I was presenting. It, so this is a so, different patient. Sorry. Can you go back to the last image? Just one question for sure. our pulmonary folks. Um, you know, when you have a chest tube, the port on the chest tube, could you comment on that? Now, in this case, this is not in the plural space. This is in the parent camera. But even if a chest tube is in the plural space, just to how to uh, monitor the port. OK, sure. So it's it's usually monitored um, by doing chest X-ray. So chest X-ray is uh, good enough. So there are uh, mm -hmm. proximal and distal ports, or I don't know, um, the side holes are called different in different countries. So you always look at, that's a very mm -hmm. good point, always look at the side holes. Um, this is inside the, suppose it's inside the pleural cavity, but sometimes it can be in the chest wall or can be outside the chest wall. So it's very important to look at that because depending on that, patient will improve or will deteriorate. Anything else? Sorry. Thank you. I, I will have uh, uh, lots of chest x-ray session. I collected almost 500 chest x-rays for PHA, to be honest, um, to show, because that's the, um, in the middle of the talk, I'm going to say, um, I have been doing radiology since 2013 and I've been clinician since mm. 2004, but chest x-ray is the most difficult um, uh, modality to interpret. I always joke with my friend, I cannot interpret a chest x-ray. Imagine for the for the junior trainees, imagine a 3D structure is represented in a 2D format. How would you feel appreciating where the lesion is located? There is a lot of chance of error, but chest x-ray is the most common modality performed to scan any tube or chest pathology or medicinal pathology. So it's very important to learn that. I'll have a series of chest x-ray uh, in terms of interpretation of chest x-ray series. So please, if you if you have time, please join me because I learned a lot over these years and still find it very difficult. And there are some tricks you can, you can get away with it. You can save some lives. So this is another patient. The reason I'm showing you again, um, the density of the fluid, if you ask me, I because I do radiology, I can appreciate this is slightly denser than normal fluid visually, but I am not 100% sure Then I put ROI. This is another trauma patient for the junior trainees. Uh, she had uh, pectus excavatum. That's why it looks so weird. So the heart is pushed towards the left side, has got a big hiatus hernia. So that's where the esophagus lies. Um, and uh, I'll show it, I've got another case. And I put ROI there. This patient had a trauma, basically had a fall, but couldn't tell anyone. So the mean is 43. That means it's high dense fluid. This is, I'm 100% sure this is blood. This cannot be simple fluid. So I told the clinician, this is blood. So when I see blood, what I do for the radiology training, you go to um, bone window straight away. Sorry, I was showing this is normal, okay? Normal um, is 12. And that right side one was uh, blood. So you go to bone window, you, you find the fracture because that's very important to find. What is the cause of this blood? Is it um, trauma? Is it some patients cannot say what happened to them? They may be dementic. So you need to find out the cause of any blood anywhere, whether a vessel is bleeding or not. Um, those are the other things you need to think about. So the next patient, so ground glass nodule. So I initially I thought I will talk a lot about lung nodules, but lung nodules uh, is a different chapter itself. So I need another lecture for lung nodules. So solid lung nodules, there are different um, uh, different country follow different uh, guidelines. In the USA, it's Flashner guideline. And in the UK, it's BTS guideline. Um, whatever guideline you follow, um, depending on the size of the nodule and the risk factors, you need to um, follow up lung nodules. 
just roughly saying less than six millimeter, you don't need to follow. This patient has got little holes in the lung, as you can see. So I can tell this is a smoker patient. So th these little holes without any um, uh, um, wall is, is a very mild level of um, emphysema. So this patient is probably a smoker. This is a small nodule. Um, I haven't measured it, but just over six millimeter. It was followed, but... Um, in the middle, she lost in follow-up, like she she didn't come or something like that. So it, initially, it was a very small. And then when she came back a couple of years later, that little ground glass nodule became this. I was talking about maximum intensity projection, if you remember, uh, radiology trainees particularly. So we always look at the normal lung window, and then we go to maximum intensity projection because our eyes cannot detect very small nodule in the middle of all the blood vessels. Suppose this may look like a nodule, but actually when you scroll, you can see there are branches, so this is a vessel. So the very small nodules are difficult to differentiate. So we do to go to maximum intensity projection to accentuate the areas of high density. The nodules stand up. It looks very nice, and you can see the nodules well. Anyway, but if you MIP or uh, put into that reconstruction of ground, ground glass nodule, it will just disappear. Because as I said, MIP accentuates areas of high density, it will um, make the ground glass nodule to go away. So don't MIP it before assessing for ground glass nodule. That's rule number one. You first definitely have to look at lung window. I saw many trainees, they rush to look at lung window and go directly to MIP, but that's the wrong way to do it. So this patient had this mass and um, had a PET scan. As uh, you can see, it's very hot. It's very metabolically active. So we do ACV max to see how active it is. The level of activity is highly avid and with a lymph node. So this patient um, had surgery and was cured. This is the PET imaging. But anyway, this is a different patient, a really unfortunate young patient, previous history of breast cancer. Uh, this time came in with chest pain, and you can see how awfully um, uh, how awful the presentation can be. So these are all metastatic uh, mass mass in the mediastinum, and also had a lesion in the lung as well, lung metastasis. And I put a picture of the brain as well. Um, there is a brain metastasis there. There's an enhancing mass uh, with lots of edema. So this is vesogenic edema from um, uh, this mass. So the mass is small, the edema is, I'll have uh, head CT lectures um, coming up soon. And I, I will uh, tell you how to differentiate between a stroke or hemorrhage and, and all this metastatic. It's quite easy. So basically the classification for lung cancer um, uh, staging is TNM8, is used uh, worldwide. I'm not sure in Bangladesh what is used. And for the junior trainees, um, I put up this picture of how the stations of limb nodes and depending on, on that, the surgical um, consideration is made. So it, depending on the tumor size and lymph node size and where the lymph node invo involvement is, not size, involvement of lymph node and distant metastasis. I'm not going to describe this. It's, it's everywhere. I'll, I'll show you the sources as well. The next one is uh, was a 67-year-old man. I'm not sure whether you are looking at the heart or not. This is the most ignored part of the body when um, we talk about uh, chest city. Um, so uh, you can see the abnormality is huge, but if you just scroll to the lungs and soft tissue, you will definitely miss it. It's a huge tumor. It's a left atrial myxoma. This patient needed surgery. Usually myxoma are small. Um, they need only follow-up. Um, this was protruding to the mitral valve. So this is left side of the heart. This is right side of the heart. As I said, this is right side of the body of the patient, and this is left side. And um, I don't have the CNA images, but it was protruding to the mitral valve, and it needed to come out. This was uh, two weeks ago. Okay, this case is extremely, extremely important for everybody because I think this is one of the biggest cause of to, um, you know, uh, legal action from the patients in this country. Uh, of course, the radiologist, uh, of course. So um, here, everything looks pretty good, but have you seen the aorta? So the aorta looks quite big. The problem is, as a clinician, probably you will not be able to um, measure it because I don't know the caliper for the films. Uh, on packs, it's titrated to the, uh, calibrated to the skin, screen or monitor, so um, you can get the exact measurement. 
But if you see this, like the compared to the pulmonary artery is huge or compared to the aorta, pulmonary artery is huge. You need to make a comment, may um, ask the clinician. This patient has got a known connective tissue disease. So you need to think really carefully whether there's any pathology going on with the aorta. So suppose this patient, this was missed, this aorta is big and comes back with this. That's a shame. A lot of, lot of patients do that, but that's a shame because you didn't it's pick it up. And the threshold for that, so basically for the junior trainees, this is a big flap. This is dissection of the thoracic aorta. It's extending all the way to femoral arteries, rest of the body. I'm not going into that um, because aortic uh, imaging is a different thing. Um, I will have a different lecture. I need the whole year probably. So um, this is the dissection flap. So that patient had Marfan syndrome with aortic uh, dilatation. So they dilate and they, they rupture or have dissection eventually. So surgical threshold for normal aorta is five centimeters. So about five centimeters uh, people get surgery. But for Marfan, I think it's 4.5. The threshold is lower because their connective tissue weakens the wall and they get more complications. It's very difficult to sur surgery as well. So that's how we measure. So on axial image, you can measure if you have a, a dicom viewer, you just put the caliper. Um, and uh, this patient had a 44 centimeter. It was incidental diagnosis. It was not, um, you know, um, she didn't have known, uh, she didn't have a known aortic dilatation. This is another patient. So the reason I'm showing you is 38 up to 38 millimeter is normal. So 3.8 centimeter is the threshold. Above 3.8 centimeter, you think about the body surface area and everything as well, but you need to let the clinician know. I think as a radiologist probably that I think the aorta is dilated. Please follow up. Maybe with echo, you don't have to do CT anymore. You can do echocardiogram and follow up the aorta. Probably cardiologists know it better. So what we do, um, we when we follow up aorta, we as a radiologist, we do not do this measurement because the, this is basically axial plane. If the plane is tilted, the measurements is going to be either under or overestimated. So we do um, MPR, so multiplanar reformat. That means we put, um, we make it perpendicular to the wall of the aorta, as you see, in two planes, so that we can get a true axial image to give you the perfect measurement. So suppose you are doubting is 4.4. Uh, or 4.7, those three millimeter difference makes a surgery or non, non surgical um, decision making process um, difficult. So we can give you the exact measurement by doing the double oblique. And that's the standard everywhere in the world. So that's how for the radiology training, you have to do MPR and you have to do double oblique plane to get the true actual measurement of a vessel. So uh, this patient who went to the dentist, the reason I put it up is he didn't get, he had a prosthetic aortic valve. And with patients with prosthetic valve, um, all the clinicians know that they get antibiotic prophylaxis before dental work. But this patient didn't get, he lives in Boston, but still the dentist didn't care or he didn't tell the dentist that he has got prosthetic valve. So the reason I put it up, this is extremely important for radiologists particularly and cardiologists. So he has got vegetation there which is seen on echo. Um, this is my case from last week. Uh, at least three or four of the um, specialists came to me, including the surgeon who operated on him, um, to uh, ask, what do I do? Like, what kind of surgery I do? So for surgical planning, he needed a CT. It's not, uh, the CT was needed for, uh, um, to diagnose the valve vegetation because echo is very good. So this is the valve vegetation attached to basically this irregular thing. I've got other planar imaging I'll show you. But what is happening here, I'll show you what is happening here on the next slide as well. All this soft tissue attenuation structure, I told you attenuation of the tissue is very important. So if I, if I point to the fat here, and if you look at there, it's a bit dirty, okay? It should be clean fat around the aorta. There shouldn't be any space between all these places. This patient in the morning of the scan, so we scanned him in the afternoon. In the morning, he developed a complete heart block. For the junior trainees, um, that's an omnia sign. That means this soft tissue. So basically all this phlegmon, so we call it aortic root abscess, but the, abscess, the meaning of abscess is different for aortic root. So there's no wall to it. So abscess is usually enhancing um, a walled off structure. This is all the soft tissue attenuation around it is abscess or phlegmonous material, all infected material around the aortic root, which is basically separating the aorta from all the other structure. Um, this is really bad. So extending along the coronary arteries as well, which is even worse. 
So what he had, so I compiled all the features in, in static images. So this is the vegetation. As I said, we use MPR to uh, diagnose it properly. So as you see, this valve leaflet, this is non-coronary leaflet, is a bit thick, which may be degenerative. He had the valve replaced two years ago, so which may be normal. But how I differentiate this, this is irregular, the bottom of the leaflet of the valve. So uh, for the trainees, these are the leaflets of the prosthetic valve, and there is a blob there. That blob is not normal. You cannot have that blob with those symptoms. So all these soft tissues are abnormal. And what this is doing, okay, all the coronaries are epicardial, so it has to run through fat. So fat is very low attenuation, okay? This is running through the pus. And what it is doing is compressing on the coronary. And also on the other planes you can see, so I will explain what anatomy I'm looking at on this sagittal plane. This is left ventricle, this is right ventricle. This is right ventricular outflow tract. This is um, pulmonary valve is here. So it is uh, that the pus or the infection is the, the front of tissues are going into the pulmonary artery and involving the pulmonary valve. So this is, um, the, for the surgeons, it's very important because they may go with a bit of prosthetic um, what's called aortic root graft, they have to repair the pulmonary artery as well to get rid of all the pus and clear this area. Mortality depends on how much clearance you have done. The surgeons know it better. I don't know whether the surgeons are here or not. So other complications for the radiologist and the clinician when you ask for CT scan for um, uh, infective endocarditis, uh, we can do the CT of the chest, but you may ask for abdomen and pelvis. I'm asking for more uh, scan, but the reason is um, the embolic complication. We can uh, we can look at it very well on CT abdomen and pelvis. Same patient had um, uh, embolic infarct in the spleen. Uh, for the trainees, this is liver on the right side. On the left side, this is spleen. This is pancreas. Had a low attenuation area. The spleen is all shades of gray, so you have to just differentiate. And on the right kid uh, left kidney had an infarct as well. So this patient was in a state and had a surgery done with a team of surgeons and doing pretty well at this moment. So this was a case from last week. Of some extra cases, will I have time to show uh, to the moderator? I'll very quickly show the cases. Uh, I think we can do probably on one or two more cases. Okay. So very um, quickly, this is hiatus hernia. Um, so patient with chest pain um, or a, for any uh, causes have a CT chest. Look at the esophagus. This is normal esophagus, quite flat and small. And, and there is a blob there. This is hiatus hernia. This is nothing sinister. You don't have to worry about it. The next case is basically when we do CT chest, um, we include upper abdomen. And uh, uh, you can see there are lots of low attenuation abnormality. This patient has un undiagnosed adult polycystic kidney disease. So he, she went for um, a check of his gene. This is another very important thing to look at inside the mediastinum. That is the, uh, this is left atrial appendage. There's a thrombus there. So you, this patient need um, uh, cardioversion. It uh, cannot have cardioversion because it will shoot up and have a um, patient will have a stroke. Similar, I was just going to show some more clots. This patient had LV infarct and there's a clot in LV. There's more layering clot in LV for a different patient. Um, I know I haven't... <laughs> had time to talk about TB, but um, I've got a few slides of TB um, I wanted to show you. So this is three in bud nodularity. So TB can present in parenchymal abnormality or airway abnormality. It can go into the pleura. It can go into the chest wall. It, it can go everywhere and definitely lymph nodes. So three in bud abnormality there. There's more um, there's some more conglomerate nodule kind of abnormality. This is miliary TB. This is consolidation like. I'm sure you have more experience um, in TB than me. This is how it is affecting the bronchi, um, some airway trap, uh, sorry, air trapping in the lung because of the TB. This is um, uh, bronchocele from TB. These are some medicinal nodes. Um, this is TB involving the pleura. So there's empyema, pericardium, and there are um, infection in the chest wall as well. Um, this is TB causing POTS disease. I think everyone is familiar with it. That's how it looks like. So last case I showed you, but I didn't discuss. I have to talk about it because uh, we all look at CT chest. So um, 
this is coronary calcification. He's only 46. He had lots of investigation, all negative. But this is coronary calcification. And he had three vessel coronary calcification. I have given you some carved MPR. So look at how bad the disease is. So um, he had three vessel severe stenosis um, and needed bypass graft. So um, the reason I put it on is um, sh to show you this slide. So calcium score is done uh, without contrast, very easily done. I don't know how available it is in Bangladesh, but comment on calcium or in the coronaries whenever you uh, read a CT chest, where any type of CT chest, because this is so important. Uh, if you see these slides, all these studies were done and it showed that coronary calcium, if you add on the risk stratification, it makes a huge impact. It makes a huge difference. Patients can be on statin and you can prevent a heart attack um, of the patient if you put them on statin, the asymptomatic one. So um, I was talking about, we can only see anatomy, we cannot see function, um, a functional information, but if some of you are aware in Bangladesh that we do coronary CT angiogram and we can do the full function on CT. So what we do, we uh, capture the whole cycle and this is left side of the heart and this is the right side and you can image systole and diastole, you can have all the functional information as well from a CT scan. And something uh, called FFRCT is in place now, it's widely used. This is kind of equivalent to um, FFR you do invisibly. I'm not going to, um, I'm just showing the pretty picture, but I'm not going into this. So take home messages. Again, emphasizing clinical context is very important. Uh, and that's how we protocol the study and how we tell you um, what's wrong with the patient. Special consideration of renal function, pregnancy, pediatric patient, um, very carefully needs to be uh, looked at. Use all windows and post-processing technique. Um, if you don't have PACs, then ask uh, uh, the uh, radiologist to give you some more windows if you are querying a particular um, structure. Comparison with previous is extremely important. It's true for every modality you do. If you do a chest X-ray compared with the previous, so encourage the patients to bring the previous images, previous films probably. Um, um, keep. Um, I would recommend clinician to keep um, normal um, CT, um, uh, maybe the uh, films of normal CT and one of your image viewers so that you can always compare anything abnormal. And you can explain to the patient probably that this is a normal and your one is abnormal because of this reason. This is pattern recognition. If you are very used to see normal studies, it's a, it will be very easy to differentiate the abnormal one and go through the anatomy one by one. If you are following a vessel, just follow the vessel. If you're following the right side of the lung, just follow the right side of the lung according to how it is given to you on the film. And structure report is very important. This is for radiologists um, because I know our patients in Bangladesh, they come uh, with a radiology report from one clinician and then eventually go to another clinician. Um, and another scan is happening in another uh, department. So the results are very difficult to compare with. And the clinician, particularly the oncologists, are in big trouble because they don't know which lymph node they're talking about, which part of the lung we are talking about. So if there's a, a system we can develop which where we can give a structured report and we talk about the same thing, it is going to be really, really helpful for the clinician. And communication is clear. Communication is the key, actually. Um, we have to do this because uh, otherwise we'll not get the right answer for the right question. And last not the, on the list, don't ignore the heart, aorta, coronary calcification at least on the chest CT. Um, some references or further reading. I'm going to give you some important resources for trainees for any radiology. You can go to radiology assistant, radiology masterclass is very good for basic interpretation of anything. And Radiopedia is the Wikipedia for radiology. I go every day. Um, so if you have any question about anything, you can just put it on. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you very much. That was an excellent. That was an excellent lecture. I think we all learned a lot. Um, I would request all the panelists and the co-hosts to uh, turn their video on the screen on, and we'll hear from the panelists first. Um, could you turn, mute the? If somebody has the microphone on. Okay. Um, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Sultana, for your excellent lecture. It was very helpful. 
um, as for clinicians and definitely for radiology residents and radiology trainees. Um, I'm going to ask the, I'm playing two roles here today because uh, Aisha Appa had to leave. Um, I will start with Dr. Asif Mustawali to hear his comments from the panelists first, and Dr. Ali Hassan at the end. He is a chairperson also. Dr. Asif Mustawali. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, presentation from Dr. Satish. Uh, you covered a lot of ground. And I'm very uh, thankful to PHA for inviting you to make this talk because it covered uh, pulmonologists, uh, clinicians, as well as it was very helpful for your uh, junior trainees in radiology. So uh, it has it helps a lot. It is uh, the cases were very uh, illuminating to us, and particularly along the clinical history. And uh, of course, uh, TB in this part of the world and anywhere in the world is uh, can be difficult often. You show some classical cases. Um, from my perspective, I think that uh, we can also utilize uh, CT in certain cases of uh, latent TB, because latent TB is now being given special uh, interest in Bangladesh also. So it's our job to rule out uh, active TB in patients who have cordiferone or uh, Montestes negative, uh, positive, I'm sorry. So it's our job to make sure that they don't have active TB before we put them on TB preventive therapy. And I believe that uh, with our knowledge of CT, we can even identify smaller active foci in the lungs. Thank you once again for your brilliant presentation and we look forward to having you on our uh, series in the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud. Um, Dr. Rumi Khan, your comments, any take on messages Hello. for our participants? Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, whatever, whatever you are. Um, so the idea, it was a very difficult task to put everything in one hour lecture because also congratulations on training in uh, chest uh, radiology. It is a very rare specialty. We are always in search of radiologists who have interest in chest. So it, you will be very much needed in our common day-to-day -day practice. And, and we're looking forward to your more service in our practice, education, teaching. And I personally, because of with the lack of radiology uh, specializing in chest, we just kind of do our own makeshift training for our trainees fellows. And, for you within one hour, it was extremely difficult to accommodate everything. I just wanted to get the opportunity to show two, three slides to, uh, to all the pulmonary fellows, pulmonary trainees are here to add on. I know if you have the time. So if I can share some of my slides, that will be helpful. Yeah. Okay, and you're going to do that. Hello, uh, all right, yeah. go ahead. Can you share your screen now? Yeah, I'm sharing now. Do you see it? Yeah, maybe two, three slides and then yeah. go. So, so one through. thing I wanted to make a point for, 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 for us, pulmonologists, is that the importance of HRCTs. This is a one millimeter cut versus 10 millimeter cut. You can see the how how clearly we can make a case of, 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 the, of the honeycomb that we could not see in in the lower air CT scan. So this is a very important to pinpoint uh, that we need to understand this, this high rare CT scan for ILD is, is specifically. Then also when you deal with ILD, especially UIPs, uh, the, to learn the lines, the interlobular and in, interlobular lines they're extremely imp important to learn the lines. These are the lines we, we see here. Uh, this is the interlobular line, in between line that is fluid or cancer, or you can look at the intralobular line, the lines go through lung lobe. They don't follow one lobe. They are going through and through. This is very, very important for, our, for chest physicians to learn the line. This is the intralobular lines versus you see here in this side, yeah, in this side, you are seeing line that is 
interlob inter that not following any law but going to a in interlobular lines so these lines are your first determinant of ild reticulations and then they, then you see the, all the honeycomb beings and we we, we are learning this attraction bronchiasis oh, as Sadia wow. said um also we are uh, lately we are learning to differentiate between uh, IPF versus UIP secondary to other uh, connective tissue diseases, like a lot of work being done by Jonathan Chang at Chicago. And uh, this is the thing I'm showing to you, that the, the, the three signs that, that's, that's, that separates UIP from IPF versus UIP from uh, some, some other connective tissue disease, like RA or something else, like state age sign, exuberant honeycombing sign and two upper lobe signs. So you see that in this thing, this is a very, very plump, very big sized honeycombs. These are exuberant honeycombs. These are the very classic of um, UIP secondary to a connective pressure. It is not IPF, uh, very exuberant. <laughs> Whereas you see that when you see a straight upper edge of where the honeycombing ends, straight edge sign, another sign of UIP secondary to connective tissue disease. So these are the thing we are slowly learning in recent years from Jonathan Chang, others work that we, we even don't need serological panel, but from CT scan itself with 87 to 90% sensitivity specificity, we can see, we can tell this is the UIP secondary to some kind of disease. Also this anterior upper lobe sign. Another thing I always saw it in a scan, I never could understand the importance of it Everything at the base is suddenly the anterior upper lobe, the honeycombing. When is honeycombing the anterior upper lobe? Um, also, another sign of UIP secondary to connective tissue disease. So, these are the three things we are learning um, actually more and more. And you see here, here UIP secondary to IPF. Here, it, it is not straight edge, it is kind of curved. It is like going up like pleural fluid. <laughs> what if it was from secondary to connective tissue disease? It would have been state age, but it's not the case here. So that is a thing we are learning as we go lately, but I will end up here. Uh, thank you for giving me opportunity. But Sadia will, I hope Sadia will talk more about this detailed stuff in the, in the future series. This one hour is not enough for anything, you know? Thank, thank you very much. Yes, this, uh, the whole CT scan, just the CT chest probably is at least, if you go deep, <laughs> It down into ILD nodules. It's each one is more than an hour lecture. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Khan. I'm going to ask Dr. Farzana Alam from Bangladesh. Are you still there for your comments? Yes. Yeah. I mean, thank you. And I think a lot of this will be what we heard so far is pretty much from the US and the Western standpoint. What is applicable in Bangladesh? If we could address that, that would be great. Thank you very uh, much. I'm going to Bangladesh. Good morning, Shabai Bangladesh. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Shabai Bangladesh. Sadia, I'm actually Sadia's fan. Okay, so oh, Janne, na jo, I'm your fan. So Sadia, I'm a two year old junior. I'm a K53. Enjoy hope. So I'm a very happy. I'm a two year old. 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 I'm a lecture and i want to emphasize few things so what she has also emphasized for us for radiologists we need to we, we need the history actually first of all we need the history and uh, i say i teach my students that you're the chief complaint the presenting complaint of the patient is poroshpathor for you so I ask them, what is your Porosh Patho? Whenever my students, they show me the drafts, I first ask, what is your Porosh Patho? Because we go through the chief complaints. And if we get more clinical information, it gives us more um, confidence to give the diagnosis and those things. And what I feel um, uh, in Bangladesh, we don't have that much good infrastructure, but we need to serve our 16 crore of people. 
So what we need, we need to have good communication between the radiologist and the physician. And this uh, platform, Sadia, when she was talking about me and she was talking to Apu, Amrajudi clinician is at the shampoo put the patient management. Always she was focusing on patient management. And of course, this is our ultimate goal, and this is our only goal to manage the patient. Ebong a platform take juno ami on it no bad day. Ebong Aushakuri um AJ history uh mother judi communication taku bhalo take jeta sadhya emphasize puts umraho chiku bhalo patient manage put the barbo plus patient. Director Dinish was a clinician there cuts the case to Sadia Bullets, the previous image. Amra Jamadikan is a confession trash, Amra previous image by now. We can't compare. Ami Hoto ILD Bolla meta increased cold loki colona Amito Bolta Batsina without previous image. At a cancer patient, I mean, previous image Natha Klepatsina. Even Amanda Bangladesh Amra Adoj get to Shamusha by Majmaja Loke Vale. Patient bolle even majh majhe shobai to akrakum hai na clinician no bolle je apna raato kichhu jana ki dar kar apni image dekhe bolle dan kia chhe. So ta kuna me bolli I am not a technologist I am a doctor. Ibang ami image diagnosis dei na ami doctor ami patient a diagnosis dei. So ibang sadia raro je ta bhalo lege chhe je structured report we are in lack of a good report format. Je ta amra shule gradually. We have to develop. Jate Ebungami Shopshuma Boliji, we have with the radiologist, we are to make, we have to make the um, clinician's job easier and more perfect. We are at your service. Ebungama, the service of consumer Hutsin, Apna clinician Ra, Ebunguijuna, Apna, the information Amad, the Kuk Darkar. I mean, ask you Shakalvala, Dhaka Medical Education, your surgery department, the agent to Bolish to me. Research bolle chhe je tumi shop amader fault kulo ke liye rakba. Ebang ami shaho amar student ra amra tomar katchte ke session ni bo amader je shob bhul report shiklo dekhar jonne. To shikhte hote je structured report ta amader ke aro help korbe. Apna apna der katch apna der service dite parbo. Ebang we need your feedback. So sadhyar onik gulo ei shop gulo jinishe shathe ei je je gulo hocchel ke patient management er ei step gulo esche ebong tar anatomy theke shuru kore shobkichu she wanted to make easier for us thank you sadia onik din por dekhlam re thank you acha thank you all thank you thank you dr alam um i will now ask dr osmani you were if you could give your comments, yes, thank you. Hello, this is Osmani from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to thank Sadia for majestic presentation, beautiful presentation in a big window. And the thing is that like, the other thing I'd like to uh, say about the organizers, they're doing very good to linking the advanced countries with a country like us. And you people, you are doing very good. We are proud of you. And in any in, in any program, when I see you uh, in the windows, I, I become very happy that I, I can even feel proud of that you are doing some advanced work in advanced countries. People like us in Bangladesh, uh, uh, we are fond of like new informations and everything. Uh, in my day-to-day -day practice, uh, CT is an important tool for us. <clears throat> we always say it like uh, in chase, every specialist is a cousin. Uh, you, you cannot do without your cousins. So cardiologists, pulmonologists, even even a neurologist, even internist, all together in the chest, it is very important for us. Well, for the cardiac point of view, I had talked with Sadi earlier. Uh, I, I always like to say that uh, uh, what I want to know about know from CT uh, for my cardiac practice, clinical practice, uh, Sadia has told all the aspect of this thing once, and I like to thank Sadia once again, and I like to request her to have an, a small window for cardiology in CT, like I can, we can we can learn about uh, coronary calcium scoring. We can learn about our uh, other uh, utilities of uh, CT in cardiac departments. 
and <clears throat> sadia it was very nice of you to invite me in this situation i'll belong and i I'll, i'll wait for next episode also thank you very much and thank you all the uh, all the attendees and mentors uh, it was a very long day for me uh, i start up at 7 and it's mid of the night and take care everybody we are proud of you thank you thank you dr asmani it was uh, yes and we're running a little late but it was such a wonderful talk and good discussion we just couldn't go um i will now ask dr uh, hanif i think i saw dr hanif on yes for his comments assalamu alaikum শোনা যাচ্ছে হ্যাঁ শোনা যাচ্ছে জি তো অনেক রাত হয়ে গেছে আসলে আমাদের এখানে প্রায় 12টা বাজছে সাদিয়ার ব্যাপারে সবাই সব কথা বলে দিয়েছে ফারজানা বলেছে সাদিয়াকে খালি আমি একটা কথা বলবো আমি তোমার লেকচারগুলা স্লাইডগুলা দেখছিলাম আর চিন্তা করছিলাম আমি পেডিয়াট্রিক সার্জন না হই রেডিওলজিস্ট কেন হলাম না তো এটা আসলে আমার এত সুন্দর করে এগুলা एक्सप्लेन করছিল ডায়াগনোসিস গুলো বলছিল খুবই চমৎকার আমি নিশ্চিত যে আমাদের যদি ট্রেনিরা থেকে থাকে তারা খুব উপকৃত হবে এগুলো দেখে কারণ আমাদের সময় এই জিনিসগুলো ছিল না আসলে আমাদের আন্ডার গ্রাজুয়েটে এক্স রে উপরে আমরা এখনো যেটা ধরি একটা প্লেন এক্স রে তো আমি পেডিয়াট্রিক সার্জন একটা পারফরেশনে কি কি জিনিস থাকবে এটার উপরেই আমরা বোধহয় মেডিকেল স্কুলে এটা আমরা আমাদের একটা কমন কোশ্চেন থাকে ফ্রি গ্যাস থাকবে আর কি থাকবে এটা এখনো ধরা হচ্ছে খুবই চমৎকার আমি আশা করব সাদিয়া এই সে বলছিল সে পাঁচশো এক্স রে কালেক্ট করেছে আমার একসময় সব কিছু এক্স রে কালেক্ট করা তাও সব মিলাই বোধ হয় পঞ্চাশটা হবে না তো সে অল্প কয়েকদিনের মধ্যে বললো যে পাঁচশোটা তার কালেকশনে আছে এবং সে এক লেকচারের এক পর্যায়ে বলেছিল যে তার এক বছর লাগবে এগুলো দেখাতে গেলে আর সাদিয়াকে আমি আবার ধন্যবাদ দিই আমি সপ্তাহ দুই আগে বস্টনে গিয়েছিলাম সে তিন বাচ্চাকে বাসায় রেখে কাজ করে সকালে একটু আগে আমাদের আর কলিক বললো সকাল সাতটায় উঠেছে সে সেরকম সকালে বের হয়ে সন্ধ্যায় এসে আমাকে দেখা করে গিয়েছে এবং বস্টনে না নিউ ইয়র্কেও সে আর একটা আমাদের তুষারের বাসা একটা গেট টুগেদার ছিল সেখানেও সে কষ্ট করে এসেছে সেজন্য সাদিয়াকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ কৃতজ্ঞতা জানাই আর আমি আশা করব এই তার এই যে ক্লাস গুলা এটা আজকে সেটা বলেছিল যে একদম ট্রেনি জুনিয়রদের জন্য কিন্তু আমার কাছে বেশ অ্যাডভান্স মনে হয়েছে আরো বেসিক এক্স এর উপর যদি একটু ক্লাস নাও তুমি ট্রেনি এবং এমবিবিএস লেভেল এটা আমরা হয়তো অ্যারেঞ্জ করতে পারি আমাদের Hmm. and uh, he who can see he can guide he can lead to amara radiologist ra ashole guide korte pari kintu amader bangladesh e dui ta samoshya dui tin ta samoshya khub boro tar moddhe je somor ekta somoshyar samadhan amar mone hoy apnar hate sa seta hocche radiology te radiology te interested hocche na radiologist radiology te jara asche tara sadharonoto sar ei ta ke khub relaxing ekta subject bhebe asche কিন্তু রেডিওলজি ইটস এ হিউজ স্যার এবং রেডিওলজিস্ট ক্যান গাইড রেডিওলজিস্ট ক্যান মিস গাইড কাজেই پیشنট ম্যানেজমেন্ট ততদিন আমরা খুব ভালো পর্যায়ে নিয়ে যেতে পারবো না যতদিন রেডিওলজিস্ট ভালো কাজ না করবে এটা স্যার ফ্যাক্ট যে এখনো আমাদের বহু ভুল রিপোর্ট আপনারা পান তাতে রেডিওলজিস্টের এটা শুধু যে আমি বলবো রেডিওলজিস্ট তাই তা না স্যার আমাদের ইনফ্রাস্ট্রাকচার আমাদের ইয়ে আপনারা হয়তো জানেন যে আমরা খুবই পোরলি পেইড এটা অনেক বড় একটা ব্যাপার কিন্তু আপনার হাতে যে ব্যাপারটা স্যার সেটা হচ্ছে রেডিওলজ ছাত্রদেরকে রেডিওলজি পড়তে উদ্বুদ্ধ করা এইটা স্যার খুব দরকার আমাদের পেশেন্ট ম্যানেজমেন্টকে ইমপ্রুভ করানোর জন্য কিছু ডেডিকেটেড মানুষ দরকার আমার এখানে স্যার আপনি ঢাকা মেডিকেলে আছেন আপনি অনেক ছাত্রদের মধ্যে আমরা যাব তাদের সাথে কথা বলবো তাদেরকে এনকারেজ করার চেষ্টা করব স্যার রেডিও এবং আপনি একটা জিনিস চিন্তা করেন স্যার 
একটা হসপিটালের সমস্ত রোগী সব ডিপার্টমেন্ট মিলে যত রোগী এক রেডিওলজি ডিপার্টমেন্টে তার দুই তিন গুণ রোগী কারণ হচ্ছে সবারই ইনভেস্টিগেশন লাগে এবং মোর দ্যান ওয়ান ইনভেস্টিগেশন লাগে তাহলে আমি এক একটা ইনভেস্টিগেশন কে একটা রোগী ধরলে আরো বেশি রোগী তাহলে কত রেডিওলজিস্ট দরকার এবং রেডিওলজিস্ট ক্যান মিস গাইড কাজে রেডিওলজিস্ট কে অনেক বেশি পারফেক্ট হতে হবে এই জন্য আমাদের স্যার ওই রকম টিম দরকার আপনি মানুষ তৈরির কারিগরের ভিতরে আছেন স্যার আপনার হাতে যারা থাকে তারা এখনো কাদা মাটি তাদেরকে যদি আপনি এনকারেজ করেন আমরাও যাব তাদের সাথে কথা বলবো রেডিওলজিতে ক্যারিয়ার করার ব্যাপারে স্যার আমি নিজেও রেডিওলজিতে এসেছিলাম আমি ভেবেছিলাম এইটাতে থেকে হয়তো আমি আমার ফ্যামিলি বাচ্চা সব মেনটেন করতে পারবো সহজ করে কিন্তু এসে যখন দেখি রেডিওলজি হিউজ আই ক্যান ডিপ্রাইভ মাই সাবজেক্ট স্টিল আমি স্যার বাইরে আমি কিন্তু বাসায় না আমি সকাল ছয়টার সময় বের হয়েছি তো এইটা এখন স্যার এইরকম না হলো এর হাফও যদি সবাই করে তাহলে স্যার আমাদের আরো ম্যান পাওয়ার দরকার এবং কিছু ডেডিকেটেড মানুষ দরকার আপনার সাহায্য প্রার্থনা করছি স্যার थैंक यू वेरी मच ফারজানা আলী হোসেন ভাই থেকে আমি একটু সময় নিচ্ছি নিচ্ছি আলী হোসেন ভাই বলতে একটু শুনবেন আর তুমি যে কথাগুলো বললে আসলে সাদিয়ার একটা লাস্ট কথা একটা কমিউনিকেশনের কথা ছিল কোলাবোরেশনের কথা ছিল আমার দুইটা ছাত্র দুইটা থিসিস করেছে রেডিওলজি ইনভলভ করে একটা ছিল তোমার ইন্টারসাসেপশন ইন্টারসাসেপশন আর্লি আসলে আমরা এটাকে হাইড্রোস্ট্যাটিক রিডাকশন করেছে সে এবং সেখানে রেডিওলজিস্ট তাকে গাইড করেছে যা রিডিউস হলো কিনা আর একটা ছাত্র করেছে যে আমাদের অ্যাপেন্ডিকুলার অ্যাপসেস অ্যাপেন্ডিকুলার অ্যাপসেস আমরা সার্জারি না করে সেটাকে আমরা ড্রেন করেছি একবার হয়েছে অনেক সময় হয়তো দুইবার লেগেছে তো এই কোলাবোরেশনটা আমাদের আছে এবং তুমি যেটা বললা রেডিওলজিতে যে পরিমাণ ভিড় ঢাকা মেডিকেলে রেডিওলজি কর্নারে যদি আমি গিয়েছিলাম ওই দিন ওখানে হাঁটা যাচ্ছিল না আসলে ঢাকা মেডিকেলে তো সারা দেশ থেকে অনেক বেশি রোগী আসে তারপরে তোমার যেই পেইডের কথাটা বললা আমরা একটা উদ্যোগ নিয়েছি বেসিক সাবজেক্টে আসলে আমাদের টিচার নাই সেজন্য আমরা তাদের অ্যালাউন্সের সমপরিমাণ একটা ভাতা দেওয়ার জন্য আমাদের একটা দাবি ছিল সেটা অনেক কম দিয়েছে সেটা আবার আমরা উদ্যোগ নিয়েছি এখন এখানে রেডিওলজিটা অবশ্য নাই বেসিক সাবজেক্ট আছে সাথে অ্যানেস্থেসি আছে সো এটা রেডিওলজি হয়তো ইনক্লুড করা যায় আর আটটা মেডিকেল কলেজে রেডিওলজি ডিপার্টমেন্টকে ইম্প্রুভ করার জন্য জায়কার একটা প্রজেক্ট নিয়েছে এটা বোধ হয় তুমি জানো আন্ডার ওয়ান রুফ সেই কাজটা হচ্ছে সুতরাং রেডিওলজিকে আসলে যথেষ্ট গুরুত্ব দেওয়া আছে তবে যেটা বললে আরও যাতে ছেলে মেয়েরাই এতে ক্যারিয়ার করতে আসে এবং এখন আসলে রেডিওলজি তো অনেক কাজ ইন্টারভেনশন রেডিওলজি তো আমি বলবো খুবই মানে চমৎকার সাবজেক্ট আমার নিজের ভাতিজি ইয়েতে আছে ম্যাথ জেনারেলে সার্ভার থেকে পাশ করে সেও ইন্টারভেনশনাল রেডিওলজিতে কাজ করছে সো এটাকে তোমরা আসতে পারো এটা আসলে কিভাবে এটাকে আরো ভাইব্রেন্ট করা যায় সেটা আমরা চেষ্টা করব কিছুদিন আগে মোয়ানজেম আমাদের পরের ব্যাচে কে ফর্টির ও ইউনিসেফ আছে নিউ ইয়র্কে তো ও একটা প্রেজেন্টেশন করেছিল পাবলিক হেলথের যে একসময় কেউ কোথাও না পড়তে পারলে হয়তো পাবলিক হেলথে যেত তো ওর টপিকটা ছিল যে নট বাই চান্স বাট বাই চয়েস সুতরাং আমি মনে করি রেডিওলজি এখন যে পর্যায়ে গিয়েছে এটা অনেকেই চয়েস দিয়েই পড়বে তো এটাকে তোমাদেরও একটু মোটিভেট করার বিষয় আছে আর আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি প্ল্যানেটারি হেলথ একাডেমিয়াকে যে আমাকে আজকে এখানে থাকতে বলার জন্য আর সাদিয়াকে আবারও অনেক ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আর ডিটেল যে জিনিসগুলো এখানে আলী হোসেন ভাই আছে আমি আদনানকেও দেখেছিলাম আরো যারা রেসপিরেটরি মেডিসিন এর আছে তারা বলবেন তবে আমি একজন লেম্যান পেডিয়াটিক সার্জন হিসাবে আমার কাছে মনে হচ্ছে তোমার প্রেজেন্টেশনটা খুবই সুন্দর হয়েছে এবং অনেক ডিটেইলে হয়েছে তো এগুলো এটা আরো করবে এটা আমার আশা থাকবে সবাইকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ আসসালামু আলাইকুম থ্যাংক ইউ ডক্টর হানিফ আম উই স্টিল হ্যাভ আ লট অফ প্যানেলিস্ট টু হিয়ার ফ্রম আই উইল আস্ক ডক্টর আম হাবিব রহমান তুলবাই আপনি এনি কমেন্টস फ्रॉम ইউ You're still uh, muted. Abner, I can unmute it. I can unmute it. I can unmute it. I can unmute it. Thank you. Right. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Jehetu Shumai Kup Shankar, just quickly, when you let in TV, you have to comment on the CT scan, role of CT scan in let in TV. তো বিষয়টা এখনো স্ট্যান্ডার্ড হয়নি 
আমি যেটা মনে করি তাহলে যে যদি এক্সট্রা যদি গুড কোয়ালিটির হয় এবং এক্সট্রাতে যদি ডাইরেক্ট এবং ইনডাইরেক্ট সায়েন্স সেটা নিয়ে আপনি আলোচনা করার হয়তো আগামীতে রেডিওলজিস্ট এটাকে আরো ক্লিয়ারলি এক্সপ্লেন করবেন সমস্ত কিছু যদি দেখা যায় তাহলে মোটামুটি ভাবে সিটি স্ক্যানের রিকোয়ারমেন্ট যেটা সেটা অনেকখানি নিউট্রালাইজ করা সম্ভব যদিও আর্টিকেল আছে আমরা জানি পড়েছি যে আপ টু থার্টি পার্সেন্ট ক্ষেত্রে যদি সিটি স্ক্যান করা হয় যেখানে আমরা টিভির ক্লাসিফিকেশন করি ক্লাস টু থেকে ক্লাস ফাইভ পর্যন্ত দেখা যায় যে ক্লাসিফিকেশন অনেক সময় আপগ্রেডেড হয় ক্লাস টু থেকে হয়তো ক্লাস ফাইভ হলো সামথিং লাইক দ্যাট তো কাজেই দিস পার্টিকুলার এরিয়া ইজ নট রিয়েলি স্ট্যান্ডার্ডাইজ ইয়েট বাট অফকোর্স ইস এ গ্রে এরিয়া যেখানে সিটি স্ক্যান মে হ্যাভ এ রোল অ্যাটলিস্ট ইন সিলেক্টিভ কেসেস কিন্তু জেনারেল স্ট্যান্ডার্ড করাটা ইজ এ বিগ ডিসিশন টু মেক আর আমি জাস্ট রুমিকে একটু ধন্যবাদ জানাতে চাই যদিও অ্যাডভান্স লেভেল কিন্তু তুমি যে ডিফারেন্সিয়েশনগুলো বলেছো বিটুইন ইউ আই পি ডি টু আই পি এফ অ্যান্ড ইউ আই পি ডি টু নন আই পি এফ রিলেটেড ইটোলজি আই থিঙ্ক দ্যাট ওয়াজ ওয়ান্ডারফুল সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ এভরিওয়ান ডক্টর প্রফেসর আলি হাসান ইফ ইউ কুড গিভ ইউর কামেন্টস thank you uh, ph for inviting me this is something in this session i am really grateful to sadia for her excellent presentation and elaborate presentation she has actually mentioned everything in her lecture uh, actually uh, we as a pulmonologist we encounter ct almost every day and uh, i think that uh, it is many of the disease can be diagnosed on the ct that does not mean any biopsy or any intervention especially in dpld if we divide the zones upper and mid and lower zone we can we can just reach in a conclusions that this could be this type then according to that type actually we can proceed for the investigations for confirmations it does not need a lot of investigations in that particular disease and she has rightly shown the uh different uh, emphysematous changes bronchiectasis and many things and even in bronchiectasis by seeing the distribution of the uh, bronchiectatic uh, cavities and the other things we can say whether this is fungal origin or as uh, invasive aspergillosis we can easily uh, find it from the ct so it is one of the most important investigations and many of the chest diseases yeah, in early it cannot be diagnosed from the x ray and if you do the ct we can diagnose many of the chest disease very early stages and even in simple pneumonia if we do chest x ray on first day we cannot see anything but if we do the ct we can find the consolidations so i think that ct has got a very important contributions for diagnosis of the uh, chest diseases and for its management and she has rightly mentioned all these things very elaborately and she has in this our knowledge thank you sadia for your excellent and brilliant presentations thank you all the uh, panelists for their brilliant contributions i think that we have in this our knowledge from her lecture thank you all thank you very much thank you everyone um and sadia it was wonderful i did not know about the isigated city although like i said um, when i teach my residents fellows i always say as a pulmonologist we do three things get a chest x ray ct scan and then do a bronchoscopy uh, but there's a lot in between actually that like dr professor al hasan said you can actually make diagnosis from just looking at the ct scan uh, it was a wonderful lecture i think we need to, we're looking forward to hear from you more um, especially like in the I add something sorry to interrupt that yeah. uh, interstitial lung disease is, is is a completely different talk so that's what i'm saying so i didn't go into detail of how to differentiate so that's what i'm going to do in a separate session because it it's more than 2 hours talk actually and about chest x ray i just want to uh, make a comment um, about a tablu bhai's um, comment basically that uh, we as i said i'm just saying it again and again i have been doing radiology since 2013 and chest x ray is the most difficult thing for me to interpret so this is the 2d representation of a 3d structure so you cannot 
unlearn or learn more, basically. So this is not for only um, medical students, I would say, um, the mentors who are here, for all your junior doctors, even yourself, the chest x-rays, interpretation, and to keep on top of it is very important because that's the first investigation we do. So the series I'm going to do will have all about tubes and uh, lines, will all about, you know, pneumothorax, pneumoperitoneum, pneumomediastinum, so all the different series will happen. So please join us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we still have the specialist experts from Bangladesh. Um, one suggestion I have, you know, we struggle here also to get the old images. That's a pain because in this country, if you get CT done at a different institution, we don't have uh, ways to view it unless they bring the CD. And I'm sure that's more pronounced in Bangladesh. Maybe we can have a cloud system so everybody loads their CT so we can access. It is a big project, but I think Jara Bangladesh has an agenda that may be an opportunity. I had thought about copying these uh, CT images on a flash drive. In 2006, we tried. It, 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 people lose it, but if we have a cloud system, that might work better. Uh, that will be something I think Bangladesh Jara Sen Tara Judi Chinta Habna Karen. Grant Tantum, Grant Foundation, Madhame, that would be an option. But any comments from anybody? I'm opening it up to all the participants and panelists. Any other comments that they would like to bring up? Well, going once, twice, no more comments. There was actually one comment. Uh, Sadia so to discuss the uh, indications of MRI, but that'll be a different talk when you do the MRI talk, probably bring it up. Um, I'm looking at the chat room, if there's any other discussions. Um, but yeah, well, thank you everyone for joining. It was a wonderful lecture. We all had good time. I know in the US it's just the morning, but in Bangladesh it's late evening. Uh, you all have a good night and we'll meet again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for PhD for organizing this. Asalaamu Alaikum. Shabaki Shubho Ratri. Good morning. Good morning. Good Bye.